Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in Psalm 51, beginning in verse 3. As we go through the Bible for the last 37 years, and this is our fifth series, and the New Testament has already completed this fifth time, and the Old Testament right up until Psalm 51. So check it out. It's all archived, all those series. It's all there for you at the Scripture Verse by Verse website. And that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com, where all you ever have to do is choose, click, and listen. And all you ever need to bring is your Bible. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we already looked at the first two verses, but I want to begin reading in verse 1 of Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. David loved God. God himself said that David had a heart for him. He was a man after my own heart, God said. What a wonderful thing for God to say about you. And yet David was a sinner. And David also knew that the only way he would be forgiven by God would be in the multitude of God's tender mercies and by his loving kindness because he didn't deserve it. So if that was true for David... It's true for me, I guarantee you, and it's true for you. So he continues in verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He needed to be washed. He needed to be cleansed. Because if a physical wound is not cleaned out, it will be infected and it could kill you. And it's the same with the spiritual wound that sin causes. If it's not cleansed, cleansed, if it's not cleaned out, if it's not scrubbed, it will get infected, spiritually speaking, and it will affect you and your walk with the Lord, make it non-existent. It'll kill it. It'll kill your walk with the Lord is what it will do. So we need to confess our sins the moment that we commit them and get cleansed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Three, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. David didn't call his sin a dysfunction. He didn't call his sin a behavior disorder or a problem situation. He didn't make up any excuses. He didn't talk about the reasons, so-called, like the modern evangelicals do, Focus on the reasons, somebody says. And while you're doing that, you're making that no-count, unworthy sinner feel pretty good about himself or herself because you're just giving them a built-in excuse, even though you don't call it an excuse. You call it a reason. It's the same thing. And God never tells us to tell him the reason that we sin. We are to confess our sin humbly and sincerely. Because God will not forgive one single excuse or one single reason, but he will forgive any sin that is repented of, humbly confessed, and admitted to. Part of God's discipline is to make his children aware of their sin and to make them feel terrible when they sin. God turns up the feelings of guilt so that his children will confess and repent so that his children will confess and repent and restore their fellowship with him. But that's not going to happen when you've got mild-mannered, panty-waist preachers who won't even call sin, sin. But dumb it down, water it down to make the sinner feel comfortable. You think that's going to accomplish what God wants it to accomplish? It will not. It'll keep that Christian in their sin and keep them from fellowshipping with God. Because because saying 
God, I committed this sin, and here's why. Shut up. Stop right there. <laughs> I told a member of my church that one time. He actually wasn't a member, but he had been attending. And I found out that he committed adultery on his wife. And we were having this little session with him and his wife and the elder of the church along with my, myself. And the guy who committed the sin of adultery looked at me. He said, Pastor, he said, I never knew that I com the reason I commit adultery all the time is because I have a behavior disorder. I stopped. I said, stop right there. Stop it. I said, you do not have a behavior disorder. You have committed a filthy, vile sin, and you need to repent of it and confess it to God and confess it to your wife and never do it again. That's what sinners need to hear. That's what God wants them to hear so that they do repent. Otherwise, they go on in their state of unconfessed sin, no fellowship with God. It'll eventually cost them their faith if they don't wake up and change their ways. Because you can't live in sin, unconfessed sin, without it whittling away at the fabric of your faith until there's no more faith left. That's what happens when you tolerate sin. So David says, I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me. There's no messing around. It is what it is. And he continues, verse 4, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. In other words, David says, against thee, thee only have I sinned. Well, David sinned against a lot of people, yet he says, against you, God, and you only have I sinned. And David said that because all sin is first and foremost a direct, point-blank assault on God. Even if you sin against somebody else, and even if they sin against you first and you sin back, primarily sin is against God. And that's the reason why God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So somebody sins against you. It's not your job to go get them back or, or mete out justice because they've sinned against God. That's his job and he'll do it. So when someone sins against you, you don't have to pay them back because that's God's business because they sinned against him first. And notice he says, I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. When we break a commandment, we do evil. Evil, evil is breaking God's commandment. No matter what that commandment is, evil is going against the written word of God. When we break a commandment, when we go against the written word of God, we do evil. That's what it is. And some people like to water down the subject of sin. Like I said, change the terminology. But there's no point in renaming it something less offensive because you are just playing a stupid, silly game. Renaming it will not make it any less than what it is. It is evil. When's the last time, if you go to a modern evangelical church, when's the last time you even heard your pastor use the word evil in reference to a sin? I'm, way, I'm, I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I'd lay down money and I'd come out ahead. More often than not. When's the last time you heard your modern evangelical pastor call sin, sin, and refer to it as evil? And talk about repentance. When's the last time you heard that, if ever, as they're jumping around on stage 
having a rock concert with his torn jeans and his untucked shirt. Man, he's cool. Can't even tell he's a Christian. Oh, like the one Christian musician said, you know, our music is so good, you can't even tell it's Christian. There you have it, in a nutshell. What's wrong with modern evangelicalism? There you have it, right there. We are so cool, you can't even tell we're Christians. <laughs> you think that pleases Jesus when he says, because you are lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth? Of course, they wouldn't know that because... They don't study the Bible. And if they do study the Bible, it's the message or some other ridiculously ungodly so-called translation that waters down the word. It's a mess. But renaming sin will not make it any less than what it is, and it is evil. There's no excuses for any sins because it is simply evil. Leave it at that. Our sins are evil. God, what I have done is evil. There are no excuses. There are no reasons that make any difference. That's not the issue. It's evil. That's the only issue. What I have done is evil. And I confess this evil that I did of my own free will. That's another thing. Compulsive behavior. Oh, oh, I have this compulsive behavior where I commit the sin of adultery or I commit the sin of fornication or I commit the sin of drunkenness or whatever it might be. It's a compulsive behavior. You know what that means? That's an excuse that means some, some outside force is forcing me to do something against my will. Liars. Liars. You sin of your own free will. God says everyone sins when they lust and when lust conceives, which begins in their own heart, it results in sin. We have to admit that. We have to accept it and confess it to God as such. Like I said, God's grace does not forgive any excuses, but it, confess, but it does forgive all sins where, when they are confessed and forsaken genuinely without an excuse. Five, behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David says, you know, I have, I've been a sinner since the day that I was born. And that's true of everybody. Everybody comes into this world a sinner. So we come into the world with a sin nature, and then we immediately start going in the wrong direction. We go in the direction of evil. We certainly are all a chip off the old block, but unfortunately, that old block is a vile, depraved block of sin called Adam and Eve. We sin because we have inherited our sin nature from Adam and Eve, like father, like son. And that's why we need a Redeemer. And there's only one out there, and his name is Jesus Christ. You must repent and receive him as Lord and Savior, or you will most certainly die and burn in hell and pay for your sins forever in the lake of fire. And don't think I'm kidding and don't think Jesus is kidding because he talked about hell more than anybody else, all other people in the Bible combined. And he certainly talked about hell more than he did heaven. Better take it seriously. Hell is too hot. And eternity is too long to toy with this. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Study all of God's Word with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Go there, choose, click, and listen. Study from four complete series going on five, verse by verse through the whole Bible. And I mean every single verse. Never watered down, not one single time in 37 years. If you'd like to be a part of this ministry that has been faithfully teaching the whole counsel of God, and if you don't believe me, go back and listen to it. You'll see it. You can be a part of this ministry by praying for me and God's Word. And also, when you take a break from studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. That also makes you a part of this ministry. So long.